Welcome, everybody. My name is Carl Brown. I am the executive director of the DC Small Business Development Center. We are located at Howard University. We have been there since 1979. And, uh, you know, I've been the executive director now going on seven years. Wow, time has been flying. But they say when you do something that you love, you uh, never work a day. And so I, I don't consider myself retired, but uh, I really consider myself as being very fortunate to be doing something that I love and doing it every single day. And so with that, I'm going to talk about just a little bit about what we do at the center. We provide confidential counseling for free. We do a lot of webinars. Uh, actually, this year, so far, we've done 32 webinars and had 459 people attend. We help people get money for their small businesses. So uh, since January, we've done about $3 million. Hopefully, we'll get it up to about 10 by the end of the year. We are a calendar year um, entity. so. Everything is based on uh, the calendar year of January to December. We do a lot of research. Now, if you own a small business, one of the, well, two of the things that you need are money and information. You want intelligence on who your competitors are, where they're located, the demographics of your neighborhood, all of that. Well, we do all of that, and again, it's free. So with that, you know, we do the confidential counseling, webinars, research, and loan package review. Those are our main things. But then we also help you with cybersecurity. Uh, that is one big thing right now. I don't know if you guys have been inundated with, uh, you know, cyber requests, phishing schemes, cyber uh, ransomware, and all that stuff. Those things are real and they're going after small businesses right now. So uh, protect yourself, protect yourself. We do a lot with intellectual property. Um, we've all heard the horror stories of folks, you know, in the, especially in the entertainment business, they, you know, had, you know, have all this music. Remember Prince had slave on his face because they owned his masters and, uh, what's the name, uh, Nita Baker just, you know, uh, told the world, I got my master's back. Well, that's how you make money. When you own your music, you make money. Every time it's played on the radio, you make some money out of that. Uh, but if you don't own your master's, you don't own the publishing rights, you don't make any money, okay? And so that's why it's important for an artist to get that, you know, and so let me, you know, that's what we do that, you know, you can come and see us with DC, SBDC.org, you know, you can reach us that way or Dr. Patrick's been affiliated with us for some years now. If you don't forget about us, reach out to her. She can put you in touch with us, but it's DC, SBDC.org and uh, all of our services are free. Now, tonight, Oh my God, I've been waiting for this, you know, because it's the end of Women's History Month, all right? But let's be real about something. And I'm looking at demographics, I'm looking at all that every single day. The number one group that is coming through my doors right now is African-American women. Come, they are number one, and they are growing in large numbers across the country. They are starting businesses, but but you know, and and let's let's look at it like this. You know how guys are. We know everything. Well, the ladies come in with a clean slate and they and a sponge. They want to absorb all that information. Guys come in and they're telling me what they want from me, and then they're not allowing me to talk. Ladies are coming in saying, "Well, how how do I get to the next level?" And how can you show me? And that's what we do. And so it's a pleasure working with women and I think women are the future. And so to have one month of his, Women's History Month is not long enough for me. That's like February being Black History Month. I mean, really? Not really. You know, it's 12 months out of the year. 
you guys rock. So, and Dr. Patrick surely rocks with us. So I'm so happy to, to be here and be a part of this. And then we got Terry Hankins, president of Terry Hankins Consulting, Dr. Tasha Bennett, Dr. Lisa Jackson, Dr. Rebecca Stewart. I'm just waiting for the pearls of wisdom to fall out all night. So with that, I'm gonna, oh, and I love the topic because this is, you know, since we've been dealing with this pandemic, this is something that we've been dealing with. You know, everybody had to pivot when that pandemic hit. You know, if you had retail, especially if you're a beauty salon or a barbershop, you had to pivot because guess what? You were closed for a period of time. So a lot of people were like, okay, well, what do I do now? So they were coming into our shop and they were asking how we can help them. And we helped them transition from a retail to uh, online. And so a lot of our businesses were able to make that money online. In fact, some of them even increased their revenues during this pandemic. I've had businesses where they have made more money the past two years than they have in the past 20, okay? In some cases, the past five. Um, and, so, and, and soon, some of them will expand nationally because of the money they were able to make and hold on to during this pandemic. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Patrick, and I'm going to sit back and just listen to the conversation. So thank you all. Thank you, ladies. I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Carl. Um, great introduction and greeting to everyone. Um, it is truly my honor to be with you today and deliver the overview of the 2022 Women's Leadership Forum panel discussion, aptly titled Navigating Change, Increasing Sustainability in Your Small Business During Unconventional Times. It is also my pleasure to welcome our distinguished scholars in organizational leadership and development, as well as our highly skilled and experienced entrepreneurs who are opening doors for others to enter the world of business ownership. I would like to begin by giving a brief synopsis of our objective, which is centered around knowledge sharing. Our goal is to provide a productive space for entrepreneurs and leaders to exchange ideas, consider varying perspectives, and discover how new methods and innovative strategies can be used for professional advancement and organizational growth. This year, for our third annual panel discussion, we're focusing on navigating change. Now, as we know, unprecedented events over the last couple of years have caused everyone to pause and consider the best and most effective way to move forward in our personal lives and in our professional lives. And yes, we know that dealing with change can be difficult and extremely challenging, but there are two things I try to keep in mind when change occurs. Number one, to use the change as an opportunity to grow, enhance my existing skills and to develop new skills that, I, that will help me to propel forward. Number two, consider my steps. Consider how I want to navigate my path. Embrace the fact that I do not have to change all at once. I can arrive at my destination by taking smaller steps if need be. In understanding these two things, we in turn can position ourselves to see the benefits of change in a different light. Now, navigating change is composed of a series of intentional acts. It requires consideration for the processes that touch an organization as a whole, processes that impact each team and those that drive each individual on a daily basis. As leaders prepare their organizations to move from their current state to a future state, they must consider that resistance to change is a natural part of the change process. And given this, several questions will come to mind. How will I, as the leader, get through to my staff the significance of the change that is happening? What are the best tactics to move from point A to point B? 
And how will I manage or operate differently if needed? We as humans tend to resist change because it prompts uncertainty and it makes us uncomfortable. Fear of the unknown, fear of a change in routine, making the job harder or more cumbersome, disruption of relationships, removing the social dynamic that so many enjoy in the workplace. And these acts of resistance can prompt us to spin out of control if we let them, but we don't have to. Practicing acceptance of the good and the not so good of the situation with equanimity, where we're making an effort to adjust with ease. This will help us to understand that we are not defined by an unconventional moment. The moment simply requires a different set of tools. Those which bring this, which brings us back to our objective of shared knowledge and obtaining the proper tools to navigate your path. So as we prepare to enter this space, consider the thoughts, strategies, and learned skills that our pan panelists and speakers have successfully implemented. And we hope this opportunity will edify your mind and reinforce your objective. Thank you. And I will now pass it on to our moderator, Ms. Terry Hankins. Thank you, Shauna. I forgot to unmute. That double mute gets me every day. Um, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for asking me to moderate the panelists and, and navigate through this discussion this, of change. And you know, change is, like you said, uncomfortable, um, but it's necessary. And the, the more we become comfortable with it, the easier it becomes. Um, so I am not going to um, talk too much. I'm going to jump right in and introduce our panelists. And I'm gonna ask after I introduce each panelist that they give a brief um, introduction themselves um, very quickly. And then also I want you to define what do you believe is change? So your definition of change. So I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Rebecca D. Stewart. Hi Rebecca, how are you Dr. Stewart? <laughs> Hello. I'm glad you started with me. That way I don't have to say what she said. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, Dr. Stewart is the Assistant Vice President of Student Affairs, Multicultural Services at uh, Missouri State University. Um, she's been in the higher education leadership and administration and program management field for over 19 years. She has extensive experience designing and executing staff development programs at the university level. She is also an expert in intrusive advising and monitoring. Um, as a strategic planner, she creates purposeful direction for her teams, prompting operational efficiency and a sense of direction for her students, which allows them to receive valuable insights and begin to implement effective routines. She is a well-respected motivational speaker and requested regularly for esteemed events. So welcome, Dr. Stewart. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all for, for being here. And uh, also thank you for that wonderful introduction, Terry. I appreciate that. Uh, so my definition of change, oh my goodness. Um, well, you know, the, the question was kind of posed about uh, uh, shifting and changing. And, and I heard Carl say pivot, you know, that dreaded P word that we've heard for the last three years. Shame on you. <laughs> Let it go. But uh, no, but honestly, we've, we've had to shift. We've had to make a pivot. Um, and, and a shift is a little bit simpler to where we say, hey, this was working, but we've had a, a wrench thrown into the plan. So now we just need to kind of redirect and take a, take a different approach. But change is to almost all out throw it out the window and start over. So after assessment and uh, coming together to analyze that assessment and say, where are the gaps? What are the needs that we have, be it the human resources that we have? Do some of those need to change? Are all of the functions still necessary? Uh, and if they are, then um, what about the functions are working or not working? If they're not working, that then constitutes a change. So change to me is is the the next step past the shift where we've exhausted all options. We've taken a look at, at all of the data and said, here's what needs to change and here's why. 
Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Our second panelist is Dr. Lisa N. Jackson. Uh, hi, Lisa, welcome. Uh, she is the interim director of new student programs at the University of Illinois Urbana Camp um, Campaign. Champagne. Uh, Dr. Jackson has over 18 years of leadership development and molding college age students. She enjoys organizing staff development and team building activities. And in the last two years, she's become an entrepreneur as well as the owner of Utopia Travel by Design. Um, her excitement and enthusiasm for travel allows her to envision, plan, and create personalized travel experiences. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. Thank you so much, Terry, for the introduction. And also, thank you, Dr. Patrick, for the invitation to be a part of, of this panel. I appreciate that. You know, uh, I'm not going to be like Dr. Student and say, you know what, what she said. So uh, I, I want to kind of add on to what Dr. Stewart said, not just pivot. Uh, is how I define change, but I also define it as what can you do differently than what you have done before. Uh, and, and when I think about uh, my life uh, and the different chapters that that comprise it, uh, one thing that kind of sparked me to want to be an entrepreneur was looking at what life is going to be like when I retire. You know, when I was younger, uh, I made some foolish decisions. And I, I withdrew money from retirement funds, uh, never thinking that that time would, would get there for me. But now, you know, as I get closer and closer to 50, I'm like, mm, Lisa, you, how, how you gonna retire? You know, I don't know if you really can retire, girl. So in, in thinking about that, I found myself being more reactionary. And while, you know, pivoting and being reactionary are part of change, I had to learn to do something different. So in order for me to begin to prepare for uh, if I retire, uh, I had to make a change. And that change was a change in my mindset, a change in how I saw things. And part of what I did was, you know what, let's get some multiple streams of income. So I see change as something that is in addition to or in addition of uh, something that can help elevate you to the next step because you know <laughs> I know I don't look my age I'm not on the 47 and I know I only get a few years left to work but I'm like I don't know if I want to stop working but I still need to have a way to have an income coming in to to supplement the type of life that Lisa gives herself so that change for me was to have a, a second stream of income outside of my, my day job, if you will. So that has been me opening up Utopia, Utopia Travel by Design. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson. Mm -hmm. Our third panelist is Dr. Tasha Bennett. Um, she is the, um, her current role is Leadership and Development Supervisor with Mar uh, Marathon Oil Company. Uh, she's been in the financial services and insurance um, industry for over 22 years. It has over a decade experience working with um, the intricacies of people development in human resources. She works currently as a learning and development supervisor at Marathon Oil, and she has extensive experience designing and implementing learning strategies, um, evaluate individuals um, at the organization development needs and um, designing and delivering e-learning courses, workshops, and other trainings. Certified facilitator with DDI and Corn Ferry 360 assessment. I'm gonna ask you to let us know what that is and what that means. Um, but she is also a lecturer at the University of Houston in the Human Resource Development Department. And she teaches instructional design, talent development and designing e-learning technology. So welcome Dr. Bennett. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I just want to say that I'm super excited to be here and thank you, Dr. Patrick, for the invitation. Um, we go back, I always share this, uh, we started together our doctoral program and I tell you, she was my champion in through the entire program and we were just there for each other through all the highs and lows. So again, I love you. Thank you so much for still going and pushing each other uh, years later after this. So I'm going to say what Dr. Patrick said. <laughs> what I did as far as thinking about change is you guys shared so many uh, little great nuggets about what is change. And I think about change as an opportunity for growth because even in um, my area, sometimes your role 
I've, I've been told several times that, you know what, your role may change. We don't know what your role is going to be. So in my mind, I always like to think of that as an opportunity for me to grow instead of looking at it on the other side of, oh, gosh, why are they doing that? Because change is going to happen. So it's all about your mindset. And, and as Carl and I think someone else said about the pivot. And when I think about pivot, I don't know if you guys watch Friends, but I always think about that episode of Friends where they were trying to carry their sofa up the stairs. And they kept saying pivot. And then sometimes you just keep trying that same thing, but then you just have to realize, you know what? Maybe I need to try something else to get there. And there, and that is where that growth opportunity lies. So I think about as far as in my current role, what I like to do, what sparks innovation for me is being able to support um, new hires and employees as far as with their growth and giving them the tools to help them to be successful when they're going through their change or they're looking for a development. Thank you so much. So we're all friends here. We're gonna get comfortable and get to know each other. So I'm gonna drop the doctors and I'm gonna shift the first names. Um, so we all stay and, and get comfortable and, 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 and get to know each other a little bit. So uh, Lisa, you spoke about yeah, I'm starting with you. Uh, you spoke a little bit about kind of that pivot and that next step from change. Mm -hmm. um, how would you talk about the distinct differences, especially you moving into and starting and being an entrepreneur, um, the difference between change and transition? Mm -hmm. And especially when, you know, thinking about it from a small business, starting your own small business, or even being in a leadership role where you may have to lead others down a different path. Wow, that that is a, a, a loaded question. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, you had mentioned in my introduction that I started my travel business two years ago. So I did start travel business two years ago, but it was not Utopia Travel by Design. Utopia Travel by Design started this past January. Uh, my initial thoughts were to start the travel business in January, February, 2020. Uh, we know what happened in March of 2020. Uh, and that kind of put like a nail in my coffin, if, if, if you will. Uh, and I had no idea how to pivot. I was trying to learn uh, how to be successful as a travel agent. Uh, so the year goes by and I had an opportunity presented to me from a friend who was like, you know, I just opened up a travel agency. Why don't you come and be a part of our travel agency? We know that you're a, a young budding agent. So why don't you come and join us? So this past year, uh, I began to work with this travel agency, began to grow my clientele. Uh, but then uh, there were some things that were going on between the agency and myself that I didn't quite agree with. So with that, from that lens, I said, you know what, Lisa, you're doing good. I'm enjoying helping people and curating these trips for them. So now it's time for you to transition and do your own thing. So within the midst of this global pandemic and all of this change that is happening and trying to figure out how to navigate that, I had to come to a realization as to transitioning. So that is how I, I see it. Uh, change is more so uh, at the moment to me in the process of where I see transition as being a period of time doing things. So I knew for a while that I wanted to do some kind of business. And I had came up with my name a couple of years ago, uh, actually maybe three or four years ago. Uh, but then when COVID hit, I had to, you know, re repurpose and, and reshift. So for me, transition is being able to, to know when you need to switch from the right lane to the left lane and continue to have your vision going. So I realized that there was some benefits being a part of an agency could, could provide me and can offer me that gave me that foundation that it, I did not have that I needed to have in order to be successful. So that's what I did last year. I, I changed. I changed and I went under the leadership of an agency. And now, right now, as I transition from that agency to my own independent business, I consider that being a transition uh, because I, I know that, you know what, you, you can continue to move this car forward, 
but you want to move this car forward in a different way. So it's not time for you to check your rearview mirror and, and make that switch over to the left lane and keep it going. Thank you, thank you. So uh, Tasha, you work a lot with human resources and developing people. From a leadership perspective and developing individuals, how would you talk about um, the difference between um, change and transition? Thank you. Um, I would look at it more, um, as shared earlier, you know, change is something that, you know, I feel like it's going to happen. Uh, so it's more of an outward thing. The transition, what I like to share with uh, employees is that, you know, just think about how you're going to get there. So like Lisa said, switching from the right lane to the left lane, but what's the piece in the middle? All the things that you need to do to get you over to that other lane. So that's how I kind of frame it to them as far as the, what the transition is, because it's more of your mental process, you know, getting yourself prepared because that change either already happened. So what is your mental process or whatever tools that you have that can help you get to whatever level that you're trying to get at in this organization, whether it's, you know, maybe, um, just learning more about that role, or maybe um, just maybe growing more of getting promoted up in that current field. And then I also like to add about change leaders. I always kind of share that in the organization as well about change leaders when we think about that, because they're kind of the people that's out there, you know, getting everybody excited about the benefits and things that are going on when there is a change. So I always like to share, you know, to leaders as well as uh, everyone in the organization that don't, you know, don't fear the change, you know, just embrace it with passion. And then when the change happens, just be prepared to just start thinking about your steps to help you get grow in that role. Thank you. Thank you. So in the last two and a half years, we've seen an increase in the resignations across the country. And we talk a lot about change and the fear of change, but we, we aren't seeing a fear from individuals that are choosing to you know, resign and, and do something different. Um, but let's talk a little bit about why we believe the cause behind people wanting to resign or do something different. Um, we can start with Miss um, Rebecca. You know, I, um, I'm in education and we have had, we've seen this great resignation just, I mean, in, in droves, but folks are leaving. At first it was, you know, oh, we can't hold on to our uh, black faculty and staff or, uh, but then it is starting to kind of bleed out and, and, and really become more than just the black faculty and staff. But the issues have remained the same, what folks are saying, they're seeking more opportunity in other places because now there's a lot of positions open, but uh, largely being overwhelmed. So when you have, when you're wearing five and six and seven hats, maybe 10, and there's more work being put on you and you find out, oh, we actually can't fill those positions that people have just uh, vacated. So we'll just split the work amongst those who are still here. So then what does that happen? What, what happens then? A ripple effect those folks will start to rumble and say, well, I actually think I need to step out now too, because now I'm taking on even more with less pay. So my value has decreased and I need to go where I can have peace of mind and also uh, less of a workload and stay in my lane of the work that I am doing. I think that that is important uh, to, to know as a supervisor, as someone who is a hiring manager, that uh, someone can only take but so much. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also uh, ill placed job functions. You know, um, if you are one of few women or black women in your space, they say, well, that we don't have a chief diversity officer because we can't afford one or we can't find the right one or they just left. So you black woman will now take on these duties of doing the diversity work as well. Meanwhile, your sole function is, uh, has nothing to do with DEI work. And uh, I think that that is another reason why people are choosing to leave because they're being saturated for one reason or another with work that is not theirs. It's, it, they've taken that line of, um, uh, uh, what is it? Um, 
other duties as assigned and maxed it out <laughs> and completely maxed it out. But some of that identity uh, driven work is falling on people that, and it shouldn't, where it should remain with the people who are considered the experts, those who have been doing that work and who are trained to do the work um, should be the ones to continue to do that work, to fight, uh, combat the burnout, which, which comes with that. And um, then we start calculating our paychecks, uh, and rightfully so, and then start looking elsewhere where the, the practices are more fair and equitable. I could say more, but I will yield the floor to uh, my colleagues here. Go ahead, Ms. Lisa. Okay, thank, thank you for recognizing me. You know, I, I see it a little different than what my, my peer, Rebecca, just shared. Uh, I see that the great resignation has been in existence forever. Uh, and what happened was we did not necessarily know that other uh, fields were experiencing, you know, high turnovers or uh, opportunities where people were looking for growth uh, until the pandemic hit. So the pandemic brought it, magnified it, if you will. So it brought a, a bigger and brighter light to people trying to find things that bring them joy. Uh, so I think part of the reason that we have this large shift uh, and we're seeing a greater resignation is because people don't know or don't have the joy. People are not necessarily doing thing that's, things that they are passionate about. You know, a prime example, you know, as, as Rebecca, I, I'm, I'm an educator and I've been working in higher education for about 19, 20 years now. And I had a recent grad student come to me and say, after being in a job for six months, I'm burnt out. Excuse me? Come again? What you burnt out from, boo boo? Because let me tell you, these years that I have been doing work, you know, you come to me and you tell me you got, you know, double digits, not to minimize the individual's experience, but how can you say you're burnt out and you just started? You know, uh, and like I said, I don't want to minimize that person's experience, but then I question your passion. I question why did you start this job? Why did you become the position, you know, why don't you apply for this job? You know, did you just do it because it was for a paycheck and you needed a paycheck? Okay, that's real talk. I, I get that we need to survive. But at the same time, don't try to tell me that this is your passion and your passion has you burnt out six months after you've been in the job. On the flip side, maybe my passion of working with students could have me burnt out after 19 or 20 years because I, I continue to you know, pour into students and to develop them and to mold them and to prepare them for when they do graduate. But that's kind of like apples and oranges. So I, I think you know, we're kind of looking at things from a different lens. So now that we're seeing droves and droves of people leaving their job, now is bringing more attention to education is the field that's being hit a lot right now. But I really honestly think that it has been going on for many years. Thank you, uh, Tasha. I wanted you to weigh in on that question from the perspective of what can we do? And, and you know, this is at the university level, big corporations or even small businesses to help retain our employees. Yeah, this, this right here is, is something huge because we are seeing a lot of this and it is um, more publicized now at this point that you are seeing people leaving. Um, I just want to share my personal story as far as me because I did, um, I was laid off at, right at the pandemic and I was kind of like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I've been working since I was 16. I've always had a job, two jobs. And I got laid off and I was like, okay, Tasha, what does this mean? So in that moment, I started thinking about what, can, what do I want to do? You know, do I have to just do something because I want to have a job or can I really get out there and do something that I want to do? So I started thinking about, you know, instructional design and um, how I could build upon that. And I ended up getting a job uh, back in l &D working for uh, the city and it was another leadership and development role. And 
the culture there was something that I was just not um, used to. I, I, I swear out of all my years of working, I've never worked in an environment that that was intense and, and that they were very um, condescending and all of these things. So I had to reevaluate uh, myself at that time and say, is this something that I want to continue? And I think I was there about six, seven months and I actually uh, decided to leave that opportunity because of the value I felt that I had that was not being um, leveraged in that organization. So my story share there is that I feel that organizations need to make sure that they are leveraging all these wonderful things that they, you know, when you interview this person and, you know, all the stuff that they're, they're telling you that they can do, you know, the reason why you hired them, you know, just make sure that you're leveraging that um, in that role. And I think someone else shared about, you know, maybe the fit for a purpose job, or, you know, but sometimes people are in roles uh, that maybe they don't you know, really have the experience for, but, you know, they took that role, what can we do to actually get them in another position where we can utilize their skill sets in a better way? So that's kind of what I think that organizations um, should do, and they are doing. I know in my organization, these are some of the things that I'm looking at, you know, looking at the jobs that people are currently, you know, looking at their talent profiles, seeing is it a match? Is it something that we can actually, uh, you know, maybe shift to something else to give that person, you um, experience and growth in that because I think that you know when people feel that their value you know that definitely does um, give them some type of uh, you know they're more engaged and sometimes when I don't say all the time they go a lot of times sometimes they just make a choice about money to leave um, that it does keep people uh, wanting to stay um, at their organization I love this question <laughs> thank you thank you Tasha um, so you know, there's a difference between management and leadership. Um, and, you know, it, how you leverage the two can make a difference when working with individuals or, or in your businesses. So um, if Rebecca, if you can tell us, you know, what you believe the difference is between management and leadership um, and how that could impact from an, um, in terms of retaining employees. So I think, um, Tasha started to talk about it a little bit, but if you can elaborate the difference between management and leadership and then how that can be leveraged to retain um, employees, but also the impact that has on our entrepreneurs really to retain employees. In my opinion, uh, the difference is pretty clear. Now, Lisa will probably tell you something different. But that's all right, that's why we're here. Uh, I, I believe that the visionary is the leader and the manager is the doer of the vision. So if you are the CEO, the, you know, the creator of the company, um, the, the person who has put the blood, sweat and tears in, then you know exactly why you developed the plan that you did you you've done the research to see what the need was in the community or the region or what whatever your industry and so you you already know you've set the the stage and and you, now you've built it until you're hoping the people will come the right people will come to work with you and um and then you lay before them the vision and in that vision, you have your long-term and your short-term goals. You have the SWOT analysis where you can say, hey, here's what we're up against. Here's what we think, you know, our acceptable loss will be in the first year. Um, you know, all of these things that your team is going to want to hear so that they can pick it up and run with it. Um, each function has to be clear. Uh, each individual should be matched to their skill set should be matched to the function that they are being asked to do within that company, that business, and um, and then the, the visionary is the one then that comes back and helps that manager with the evaluation and seeing are they on track, have they met the benchmarks, um, and then if not, you know it's time to pivot, regroup, um, and and figure out another way if we need to transition into something else, another plan, uh, or modify the plan to be able to reach the goals that have been set forward. So in my opinion. Those are the differences in uh, in this scenario in a, a, a leader and the manager. Your manager also is your day-to-day -day person. Um, not to say that the, the 
that the um, leader just goes and sits somewhere. They're continuing to build partnerships, continuing to, to foster that business in the other ways. Now that the workers are taking care of the groundwork, they're able to continue um, getting the funding, writing uh, more grants, proposals, expanding the business if that's the direction they wish to go, and uh, bringing in uh, new folks to work with the business that can help to grow it and uh, uh, grow that return on investment as well. I was so glad to hear you say that vision and be the visionary because I think, you know, oftentimes people jump into businesses or starting their businesses or even into, I, I would say leadership roles. And, and, and when I think of leadership, um, it's many levels, but when you're at the top, you have to have a vision for your organization and you have to be able to um, instill that vision and empower your team to implement it. And so I think, you know, from a manager, the manager is managing that day-to-day -day activities. They're making sure things get done. That leader is making sure they're looking down the road um, and trying to see, you know, stay two, three steps ahead. So thank you for bringing up the visionary um, part of that. Lisa, any any insight or differences of opinions there? Why you got to call me out like that, Terry? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, so uh, I, I would say, the, the one piece where I find a little bit of difference in that is that um, can these terms be uh, synonymous? You know, can you can you be a manager and a leader? And I, I believe that you can. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when I look at the position that I currently hold, uh, I am responsible for organizi organizing uh, an orientation for about 8,500 freshmen. Uh, and there are times, you know, on my team where I am managing the day-to-day -day task of what that looks like and how the program will look for our, for our freshman students. But then there are times where I step back and I say, you know what, someone else may be a, a stronger individual to lead the team forward in this, while I am the one that, that is responsible for the entire outcome of it. I have to be able to recognize when it's not suited for me to lead. Uh, and I also recognize that sometimes uh, it's, it's me being in the trenches with my team. So I often tell my team that, you know what, just because I am the director does not mean that I am not going to be out here with you all helping manage and navigate things that happen with the students because I will. Uh, so I, I kind of see them as synonymous, if you will. Uh, but being able to know where your strengths lie at, uh, I, I do see it being a visionary piece as well, but you also have to be able to know where your strengths lie. And sometimes everybody's strengths may not lie in being that visionary person. So you need to be able to know, okay, I am going to be your inquisitive, your inquisitive individual, or I am going to be the one who confronts you. You have to be able to realize and accept and understand what role you play within the bigger picture of everything. Thank you. So oftentimes, you know, with management, there's benefits to it. And you have to shift from managing day-to-day -day activities to managing outcomes with your employees. And I think this goes back to that the vision, having that vision and making sure, and that the leader or the manager may be making sure those day-to-day -day activities are getting done, but as a leader, you're, you're interested in the outcomes, you know, because it ties back to your, um, your vision for the organization and your outcomes that you want to achieve. Um, so uh, Tasha, can you talk a little bit about how do you make that shift? Um, and I think it goes back to, you know, exactly what Lisa was saying is that balance. As a leader, you have to be visionary, you have to be strategic, but sometimes you do have to get into the weeds. Um, talk a little bit about how do you make that shift? Exactly. That's it, Terry. That you you are right on. And, and what Lisa said and <laughs> Rebecca said, all of that. Um, when I think about it, uh, you have to have elements of both. Uh, because in being in a leadership role, you're going to manage things. You have to manage processes and things like that. You're gonna have to do that. But I feel like when you're thinking about um, getting the management outcome of the employees. That's when you kind of shift over to uh, your ability to influence. And you know, 
getting, I guess, extraordinary results out of the people who are in your team. And I even like when Lisa shared that, you know, you may not, you know, may or may not be the strongest in this, but identifying that, you know, someone on your team may be stronger in that. I think that's what really makes a great leader is when you recognize that, you know what, this person is strong in this and then giving them the opportunity to build upon that. So that's what I feel like when I think about, um, you know, being able to manage the outcomes of employees is just knowing uh, your employees, their strengths, their opportunity areas, and giving them an opportunity to, again, um, use those skills that you, you hired this person to do. Because I think sometimes when you lean more on the management piece, um, you kind of remove their choices because you're kind of like more of directing. But again, there's times where you do have to get in there and direct. And even some of your employees, you may have to direct a little more uh, depending on them and their uh, you know, engagement in that role. So that's how, what, how I just feel. Just making sure that you just you know, manage the things you need to manage and lead the people that you're supposed to lead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so staying in that, on that topic, a little about um, we talked and we talked to touched upon this earlier, um, leveraging the skill set of the individuals, looking for opportunities for them to maybe grow in a different area, learn something new. What approach or what should leaders or entrepreneurs that have their own businesses that have employees or people working for them, how can they avoid not recognizing? the potential in someone on their team, missing that opportunity. Because sometimes you, you forget and you, there's a potential there that you're not leveraging, you're not taking advantage of. And so maybe someone has a personal experience in that space where they you know, had someone on their team and they didn't recognize or didn't leverage them or, you know, or enable them to rise to their potential. So maybe um, Rebecca, I don't know if you wanna to talk to a little bit of how you avoid um, not recognizing talent in individuals around you, or even giving a personal example of where you may have led that. And I actually may end with one of my own where I have an example of that. But we'll start with you, Rebecca. It was actually, the minute you asked that question, I was thinking about a personal experience um, where I was the individual who was, my potential was not realized um, and, and I was overlooked. And, and I can say this was, um, early, early, early in my career, uh, especially in, in higher education. And I, ha I worked for a woman who um, this individual just refused to believe I could do anything. And, and I didn't grow up that way. So I, was, I wasn't raised by, you know, by a family that was like, you can't do it. You're dumb. You're, you know, all the things I wasn't put down. I, I didn't run in a circle of friends that uh, we talked to each other that way, you know, and I, there was nothing in the world that I didn't feel like I couldn't do. You know, I'm a child of the Cosby's in uh, a different world and I have a voice in this world and it deserves to be heard. So I didn't understand why this woman was so mean to me on a regular basis. And openly, I create a, I, I'd run a program or an event, um, have something at that time I was, well, I won't tell you where I was, I guess that's not appropriate. So I was at another campus, the large research one institution, and, and she uh, would whisper in the sidelines, <laughs> she thinks she knows something, she doesn't know what she's doing. I'm like, yes, I do. I mean, I might be a young professional, but I, I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm giving it my gut, my, my best go. Um, the, the very best day which we shouldn't relish in other people's downfalls. But when she carried her box out of that joint and said, I'm done, I can't handle it anymore. and had a little apology session and we were like, we'll see you, can we help you pack the car? Um, as soon as she left, the, we had to shift and kind of take over, but that position was now vacant, this director role. And uh, my colleague said, wow, we didn't know that you were able to do some of these things, that you had this skill or this capability. And it was all hidden underneath her, um, her uh, teacher's pet, so to speak, her favorite. And, and I didn't get those opportunities. But the minute she got out of the way and it created more opportunities for the rest of us to kind of see, you know, try things, see what we what might be good at, where our skill set may lie, um, interests that we may have that we didn't know we had coming into the roles. And we were all fairly, uh, fairly young folks too. So it was just kind of like, hey, we're on this job. We don't, we don't really know. We didn't have great leadership, but now we've, we have a, um, 
we at least have a template. We know what, what we're supposed to do. We have a mission and a vision, and I think we can do it. And we were able to pull it together from the team side. And so um, as I've become a supervisor over the years, I've just looked at folks and, and I say, hmm, okay, so you're not excelling in this area. Why is that? So let's talk. So when we do our coaching sessions and um, advising with uh, mentoring with your, your staff, um, you know, what are your interests? What, what, what brings you here every single day? Where do you find the most joy? Or even saying, I've noticed an observation, you really get excited when you have an opportunity to engage in X. And you're actually pretty good at it. If there were opportunities that we created more of where you were able to do these things, would you, would you want to do that? Would you want to do some more of that? Uh, and, and typically, I mean, I, I have, I don't think I've ever had anyone say, no, nah, not really. I'm not cool with it. No, they usually, they say, definitely, can I help you um, plan and, and create some of those opportunities? You most definitely can, you know, and that's giving someone an opportunity to, um, they've, they've kind of found their niche or they think they have, but they're going to explore it. And uh, maybe it doesn't go over so well, but maybe it's great but we don't know until we try. So I tried very hard in addition to matching folks uh, with the functions or the, the um, uh, whatever's needed. I, I tried to match their skill set, but also their interests so that they're not just coming to work every day um, in a robotic format saying, this is what I do, I do it every day, but this is what I do. And here are the things I get to do that I really enjoy and I excel in. Um, ultimately, you know, they say happy wife, happy life. You know, you have a happy team when people are coming in doing work that's challenging to their minds, but also they're getting an opportunity at the end of the day to say, hey, I actually did a great job. This is something I'm, I'm good, I'm proud of myself for this. Um, so, so being able to be encouraging uh, also, but those opportunities have not been missed when you apply, um, talk to those folks and, and, and give them a, a compliment, recognize that you see something in them, uh, and, and then try to find a way to work together to pull those things out to get the very best out of those employees. Thank you so much. As you were t telling your story and your experience, I literally thought you were telling my story. I went through the exact same thing. Um, and you have those roadblocks. And it's like once that roadblock moves, you excel. Um, and people are looking like, where did you come from? And I'm like, I was always here. I just had that blinder, that block. Um, but you also mentioned um, some of the questions that you ask individuals around what they're expired to do. I think that's important even for entrepreneurs to ask themselves those questions. Because I really think that that'll start to bring out what they are passionate about what they really want to dream. And then it goes back to what Lisa said. It may not be a change, it may be a pivot. You may pivot in what you do um, just by continuously asking yourself some of those questions around what you're passionate about, what's new, what's changed, um, et cetera. So thank you for sharing, uh, Rebecca. Did Tasha or Lisa have anything to chime in there or have any examples of similar scenarios? I just like to share, I love uh, this conversation. And it's it's very sad when, though, when we see those missed opportunities. And I feel like the one way that leaders can do this, and like what uh, Rebecca was sharing and Terry, is that we have to be more involved, invested in the growth of our employee. If we understand that you know development is part of our DNA and what we're supposed to do, then having those those conversations initially will help to, you know, it's not gonna eliminate everything, but you, you won't have those missed opportunities because that is the one thing that always breaks my heart when I hear that this person had this talent and, and you know, as a result, they felt like they were overlooked or we didn't use that talent. So again, having those conversations and just, you know, understanding what do you wanna do? Because, you know, you may think like, oh, they're, they're happy doing whatever, but really there's something else that they have so much passion about doing. So I think as, as leaders, we just need to be a little bit more involved. I had somebody tell me, oh, we're having a touchy feely conversation, but it's not really, you know, like that is that I really want to get to know you and what makes you happy. And, you know, because I want to bring that out, you know, and help you reach your potential, whatever way I can, by giving you resources, you know, by introducing you to people, by mentoring or whatever resources you have available. I just feel like that's my obligation as a leader um, to help my employees there. 
because I don't want to hear that missed opportunity. Um, stay with you for, Lisa, did you have something? No, that's what, you go ahead. Okay, I was going to stay with you for a minute, um, Tasha. You spoke about, you know, just having those discussions and talking with the individual and getting to know them and understanding what they're passionate about. How much of that is culture, workplace culture? Because a lot of times, especially in big organizations, that's not something they they corral around. You know, it's it's doggy dog, you look out for you, I look out for me. How much of that is culture and how important is that in the organization? You know what, Terry? It is a lot of, I'll say most of it is the culture of the organization. Um, I was fortunate when I started out of college to work for State Farm, which was a huge um, organization, but that part development was in their DNA. That was something that off the bat, you know, they talked about even when I was hired um, in my orientation as far as, you know, you, you can, get, you can uh, transition to all these different roles when it's State Farm. And I was excited. And having one-on-ones was not anything that was new to me because we did that. That was a part of our structure. I moved to a smaller organization and one-on-ones is like, what is that? You know, we don't want to talk about that. You know, we need to work, 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 work because that was a part of their culture. They weren't really concerned about uh, people and their development. It was more about, look, we're here, you know, finish your job and do what you need to do. So I do feel like it, it is um, based upon the organization, but I do think the pandemic now has really uh, shed light on that because a lot of people now are like, well, you know what? I wanna be somewhere where I feel valued. And if I can't get back here, then, you know, maybe this organization uh, will fulfill that and I will go there versus just staying in a role you know for years where you don't feel valued or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. So um Lisa just um piggybacking on that what's what steps are needed or as a leader is needed to build that cultural competency and how is that important in you know an entrepreneur um environment or even in the office because i really look at sometimes or i believe that we talk about the leadership and relationship to employees but when you start talking about culture etc it also extends to your your customers and your mm -hmm. clients and so mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how as a leader whether you're in the office place or you're an entrepreneur you start to become more culturally um, competent you know, I, I I think a lot of it, Terry, uh, is based off of intentionality. Uh, and, and I say that because one, one thing that I have noticed that I have grown in, people will not believe that I'm an introvert. So uh, pe people get shocked by that often. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm that shy girl that sits in the corner and, and won't go out and interact with anyone else. However, when it comes to uh, getting students excited and ready for their first year, I would be that one person up in front of 8,500 people that would be jumping and singing, you know, whatever I have to do to create that energy. I'm intentional about that. Uh, I am intentional in, in knowing when I need to quote unquote show up. You know, I always show up. Uh, but how I show up depends on a variety of things. Uh, I also know that one of my strengths is being a relationship builder. You know, uh, I, I have a genuine care for people. Uh, and sometimes some people uh, get a little frustrated with me because they want to just like straight into the business. I'm like, uh-uh, how you doing today? You know, what, what's wrong? You like something's bothering you. And that's coming from a place of sincerity from me. But for some people who just, may be caught up more in that the cult the environment the culture of their environment they just want to get the business done but i want to make sure that you're okay that you're in the right head space before we begin to move forward in getting whatever that business is done so i think being intentional and being able to know uh your personality traits kind of all play a, a, a role in how that can happen well what's your myers briggs <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an ISNJ. 
Okay. I'm ISTJ. Yeah. <laughs> but it changes. I, and it, Cause I used to be an ESFJ and I was really? like, really? But I guess as I get older, I get more quiet. Mine hasn't changed in over 20 years. Every oh, time good. I take Ooh. it, it's been Ooh. the same. <laughs> yes. Mm. All right. So Rebecca, I um, want you to chime in a little bit about kind of the type of workplace culture. How do you build it? And why is it important? And the benefits that can arise from having a purposeful culture? I think uh, building trust first, you know, building rapport. Um, but also, as Lisa was talking, I was thinking about um, just knowing, you know, we talk about knowing your audience when you're making presentations, things like that. Uh, knowing who you hired. So if you're looking at a, an entry level position and as you're planning out this position, you say, um, this is, this is going to be a, an up and coming, maybe a uh, fresh out of grad school or fresh out of undergrad. Um, this individual is going to have certain skills. They will have uh, taken had a particular major or minor, uh, we want them to speak a certain language uh, to some proficiency and so on and so forth. You, you outline who you want, you get that individual. So what does that mean? How do we retain them? How do we um, keep them connected to the work? How do we uh, empower them and energize them to continue to do the work and bring them along and uh, make them a part of the team? So knowing that going in, that this is who you asked for, having a six hour face-to-face -face meeting, no cell phones, no food, no uh, nothing to get up and go and, and, and keep their interest, that person's not gonna last very long. So I use, I mean, look, Lisa's like, I'm not either. I won't either, not six hours, not today, not anymore. Attention span is real short. But um, when you, you know who you brought in, then you have to figure out how to retain them. We can't say, well, I don't know why uh Dre would leave yeah I mean he's 25 and he's got his whole career ahead of him why would he just leave this job this is a great opportunity well it sounded like a great opportunity but we didn't we didn't treat him the way he needed to be treated on this job as a, as a new professional so I, I think recognizing who we've hired um the roles that they, that we intended for them and then uh, not being afraid to open up and share uh, really communicate. If you expect them to share their story, and you're, then you need to share your own, including the business, the story behind the business, as well as your own personal story. Uh, and get down in, into, like you say, we're going to drop the um, uh, titles. So get into the nitty gritty. Who are you? If your employees don't know who you are, they cannot trust you. They will not work with you and your business will fail. And, and the rest of the community that you are trying to reach out to, to uh, that, that is your clientele, they will feel that as well. You know, it's no different than uh, word of mouth. Everyone on the screen, if someone walks into a, a, I don't know, some place of business and, and they walk out and say, the customer service there is terrible. Those people need training. This is horrible. And then I say, oh girl, I'm about to go over to the same. Don't go there. The customer service is terrible. I can find that product elsewhere. I'm not going to worry about it. So now no one is going because word of mouth is your customer service is terrible and your people need training. So um, knowing that that can be the outcome, you want to make sure that you foster from within. So whatever your, your, uh, go, your not your goals, but your um, values, your personal values, the values of your business that you want to uphold and, and portray, you want your staff and, and uh, your employees to also do that. It's the Chick-fil-A model, right? <laughs> that's, that's what everybody should strive for ultimately is that um, what we say we value, it's actually demonstrated. And, and I really think that that is important to continue to grow from the inside, but also demonstrate that value um, and, and keep your, your workplace culture where you think it should be and that it, it's, a, it's a clear representation of who you are as the um, uh, leader, CEO, uh, director, the owner, all of those leadership roles. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we're gonna um, make sure we have time for questions and answers. So I have one last topic or question for the panel group. Um, and it's around continuous learning. And we started this off and one of the missions or goals of this session was to share knowledge and make sure that we are sharing knowledge across. 
Um, so I, I'm going to wrap up with each panelist, just talking a little bit about the importance of continuous learning, whether it's in creating an environment where your employees or your um, the, your team members are continuously learning, but also you as an individual continues learning. Why is that important? Uh, so we can start with um, Tasha. Thank you. Um, continuous learning is, is extremely important. You know, it's sometimes we don't even realize some of the small things that we are learning um, on a daily or uh, weekly basis. I mean, even learning something as, I'll just say, utilizing uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams, you know, someone had just shared, hey, you know what, maybe you should consider Teams, and I was against it because I was like, no, 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 I like Zoom, 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 Zoom. But I, one day, I just decided to just go in there and do it, and I was just like, oh my gosh, um, my virtual classes that I have with my students, this is so much better for me to use this versus um Zoom. So instead of me just sitting there saying, no, nah, I don't want to take the time to learn it, which is really what it was. I just didn't want to take the time out. You know, just removing that block and understanding that, you know, continuous learning is just is something that will be in any area of your life. There's always something for you um, to learn more about and to grow and stretch yourself. So I think that a lot of times people uh, maybe don't want to learn, not to speak for myself sometimes, is the fear of failure, because it, you know, even with something as simple as, as, simple as doing this um, teams, I felt like I wasn't going to be good at it, and I was like, I don't want my students saying, what are you doing, and oh, she doesn't know, she doesn't, so I'm just going to stick to what I know what I'm doing, which is Zoom, but I let that, you know, that fear keep me from doing something that enhanced my course and made it so much better and easier for me to get the recordings, you know, it just automatically got the all of those things because I was letting my internal uh, inhibitors keep me from growing in that role. So I would just like to say that, I mean, I think that it's extremely important and you definitely want to make sure you get past that mental block or whatever it is that's keeping you uh, from understanding that, you know, continuous learning and growth, that's a part of life. And, you, and you know, that is how we continue to grow and stretch ourselves. So I am an avid believer of that. I know it's funny because being in the LMB role and how I was just so stuck with not even wanting to try teams. Um, but I heard it word of mouth. Someone said, Tasha, you need to try it. And I said, okay, I'm going to try it. And now, I mean, I'm always, you know, on a meeting talking about the benefits and the things that I've learned just by opening myself up to that. Those little things you changed, you know, kind Man. of navigating change. And it can be the smallest little thing, but um, the benefit on the other side is always important. So, Ms. Lisa. You know, so in, so in thinking about uh, how would I respond to this question, I, I kind of go back to uh, the entrepreneur side. Uh, I, I'm a huge advocate of learning never stops uh, and the continuous learning piece. Uh, my travel business was not my first attempt at a business. Uh, I did attempt a business when I was around maybe 19, 20 years old. Uh, and I found myself in my younger years, you know, wanting to, to dip, dip and dabble in all of these different things. Uh, but nothing was never the way that I had dreamed it to be successful. Uh, so I think the piece that was missing was that I was not learning. Uh, I had not challenged myself to continually learn about nails because I was a nail technician at one point. I got my certified nail license. So I did not continue to keep myself abreast uh, of trends and different things that were going on and how the nail industry was, was growing. So because of that, I was not successful. Uh, and, and things that I do now differently is that uh, I know I have the mental capacity and the bandwidth to learn more because I'm, I'm well educated. So I'm like, okay, you, 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 you can you demonstrate that, that you can be able to do this. So you got the brain cells to make it happen. So in, in looking at that, I challenged myself and I said, well, why didn't the nail business work out for you? And as I just shared with you, it was because I, I didn't do any training. I just learned how to do the nails and I thought that was it. But what I have learned with my travel business is that while I have learned how to book trips for clients, there are different things out there that are 
happening in the industry that my clientele may be interested in. So I have to continuously stay in some type of training mode in order to offer those type of services uh, to my clients. And I think that if I would have known that 20 years ago, that I probably would be sitting maybe as an owner of a nail salon uh, instead of doing a travel business, or it might've been in addition to, but I was able to take those lessons that I learned from 20 years ago and apply it to these new entrepreneur business that I, I'm beginning to start to grow off of the ground. Thanks, Lisa. And we're gonna wrap up with Ms. Rebecca. I was in an interview this morning. Um, it was rough, I have to tell y'all, it was rough. Uh, I, we asked questions to this gentleman and he, you could clearly see he was outdated. Um, but he kept saying he had 30 years experience here and there, but he was using outdated terminology. Um, his, his answers were short. So I said, oh my gosh, I said, throw this question at him. So I told him out of here, I said, ask him, how does he stay current in the field? This brother said, I read and thank you very much. Okay, so that was that was problematic. Reading is wonderful, right? It's fundamental, but it's problematic for several reasons. There were no examples. He didn't elaborate. He didn't share with us what we were reading so we could all learn. Maybe there are some tools out there that we could pick up. Um, and, and I use that as an example because as leaders, we have to model the way. So if you created a culture of learning, continual learning in your business, then you're going away to events like this, you're meeting with other um, masterminds in the business world, and you're talking about some of the issues that you're facing, or some of the articles that they may be reading, some of the other places they've been, or, or, or research they've gathered that have been useful within their business. You're going to take that back to your, your shop and say, hey, y'all, let's talk about this. And you're going to make a presentation to them and say, that, does anybody have any ideas, any thoughts? You know, how can we avoid making this mistake? Or I think we're on the right track. Let's talk more about this information that's been provided. And then they'll say, oh, she does that. Maybe when I go away, I come back and I bring back information to the group. So we're all learning. If we come across books um, and podcasts, I mean, there's just no reason today to say I didn't know or I wasn't sure or I didn't have a contact. So building your network and coming back, sharing that information uh, within to help everybody grow and demonstrating that to them that it's important to you to, um, for your own business, it's important that your, your faculty, your staff, your employees, whomever they are, um, that they stay up too. And that you are trying to help develop them for themselves professionally, but also for their role that they play within your business. And, and I have lived my life that way. I don't value other people who do not, um, I don't value their leadership if they do not uh, stay current. And uh, people in my circle, you know, Lisa's in my circle. Y'all are all in my circle now. Lisa's in my circle. Um, Shauna, I've known her for 20 years. And we have difficult conversations uh, prof professionally and personally. So you have to have people from different industries. Shauna's in corporate, I am not. So when I'm like, well, I'm gonna purchase with my feelings. What are your thoughts about? She said, nah, girl, fire them. They gotta go and hear the reasons. Contact, you know, I'm like, dang. I joke with her and say, I wear my, what would you, what would uh, Shauna do bracelet all the time? What would Shauna do? Um, Cause it gives me that edge that I need, but she can also throw some resources to me that have been useful in her industry and, and vice versa. And I think, so it's important to, to um, you know, have a broad uh, network of people that you can uh, talk to. I love that this is for women because everyone on this screen can learn something regardless of the industry in which you are um, participating. But fostering, fostering that culture of continuous learning has to come from the top down and with the expectation and accountability, some follow-up. I wanna know how you spent my money when you traveled to um, uh, White City, Oregon. You know, I want to know how, what you did while you were there. What did you pick up? What resources can you bring back that's going to help us? And I want to know those things. So that's my, uh, my contribution to that. Thank you. And I would say that, you know, as leaders or entrepreneurs, when you move into that space, people are now looking to you. And so then it's important to keep up on education and the latest trends and the latest of what's going on, because they're going to come to you for questions. And it's not to say that we have to have all the answers, but 
have the resources where we can find the answers. So building a network like this with multiple people is always important. So with that, I would like to thank each of the panelists for their participation in this. And I think we're gonna move into questions and answers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Shauna. You're on mute. That would help. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Uh, this has been wonderful. Um, I've learned some things. I hope everybody has been enjoying as much as I have. If you have any questions at this time, feel free to type them into the chat or you can come off mute and ask a question. Feel free. We're going to take some time to do that. Or if you have any comments for any of the panel. Phil, well, I, I got a comment. All right. <laughs> Let's hear it. I, I had to, to really, really, really use my discipline tonight because this conversation was on fire and it was so many times I wanted to just jump in the middle. But, you know, just thank you all. It's been a great conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Learned something. And, you know, anytime you can keep a man like me quiet, that is a, a feat in itself. So, you know, because I got a lot of opinions. <laughs> I've been around, I've done a lot. So, you know, but I learned a lot tonight and I really, but you know, one, one thing, one thing that I was thinking about was this. It, it, you know, and I heard a lot of really good intellectual uh, discussion on how to deal with people. But then, it, you know, the, the, the hearings um, for the uh, um, Supreme Court really showed me a whole nother thing. And we knew the Republicans going to be um, difficult and, and really unruly at that, you know, at the hearing. But, are, you know, are women, are, how do you feel about the way you're being treated in the workplace? I know it's a broad question. I'll chime in. Um, you know, I work in corporate America. I work with, I'm in IT, so I work with a lot of um, males. Um, I always say that it's funny. I'm, I'm a man, part man. I was probably supposed to be a boy and, and but I'm a girl. And it kind of rolls off my back. But I work with a lot of people that you know, they've called out to me, why did you take that? Why did you say that? And I'm like, I can throw it right back at them. So I think some of it, you have to have some thick skin to be in the industry. You have to stand up for yourself um, and not be afraid to voice your opinion um, and, and not, but don't put up with things and do it in a tactful way. So I haven't seen personally, and I, and I say that again, because I think I was supposed to be a boy and not a girl, but I don't, I deal with them differently. I don't take it personally in the workplace is work. I'm here to do a job. I get the job done and I'm a roll with the best of them. So if you come at me, I can come right back. And, you know, being in IT, they also thought I didn't know anything about technology. I didn't have this. And, you know, so they would say little things and I would just sit back and listen. And then all of a sudden I'll throw something out there and they're like, hmm, wait a minute. She, she know, she know what she talked about. And over time, it, you built that respect. And so I think in any arena, it's about building respect on both sides. Just like I want them to have my respect, they, you know, they have to earn mine as well. And mm -hmm. that's, so not putting up with the mess, I, I encourage anyone in any environment, but do it tactful in a, in a nice way and put a smile on your face. That's hard sometimes for me because my face will say it all, but, you know, put a smile on your face and, and, and keep it moving. But, um, yeah, it, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge and it's something that we have to be aware of and be cognizant of. You know, we, you, oh, Lisa, you wanted to say something? Well, I was going to add on to what Terry uh, just shared is that, you know, uh, being, uh, I'm often the only black woman at the table. Let's put it out there. Uh, and then to add the hat of being well-educated uh, and 
getting to a place now where people do need to call me Dr. Jackson when I'm at work, um, I have learned the power of my word uh, because I am going to get respect. Uh, you may not, we can, we can agree to disagree. However, if you come to me sideways, know that I can just as eloquently come to you sideways and check you with the way that I use my words. Uh, I too know that my face shows a lot. I've been looking at myself on this camera like, whoa, your eyes getting big. You know all this stuff, girl. You think too much right now. Uh, but I, I, And I know that my facial expressions can say a lot, but I have also learned how to have uh, individual individuals respect me at the seat that I have at the table. And I have gained that respect by not getting like Lily from the South side of Chicago, I would talk to them like Dr. Jackson needs to talk with them and use my words to cut them. And then they will sit there and say, okay, you know what? Maybe we don't need to cross her no more. You know, maybe we need to approach her a little bit differently when we have a, a disagreement with her. So I, I think in, in knowing myself and in knowing how to get respect that I have learned how to use my words more effectively to, to help me stay in that, that seat at the table. You know, I heard, uh, I was watching another panel discussion of people who, and it was primarily um, African-American women. Uh, they were asking them, well, why did you, you know, this is the great resignation. Why did you leave your company? And what two of the women said at, and this was, they were being interviewed by a news station. Two, what two of them said was one, one lady said, during the time that I was home and uh, her company did not, uh, was not bringing folks back at the time. This was a couple of months ago, I'm talking about like around October, November of, of uh, last year. And she said, not once was I sexually harassed while I was sitting at home. And that's why she's leaving the company because they were gonna come back in January. And the other woman said that I've been called names like monkey and all kinds of names at work. And they want us to come back soon, but I'm not going back. I'm gonna quit that job too. And I, you know, I've, I've, as a former commissioner, uh, dealing with human relations commission, you know, work where we would investigate that type of stuff and bring charges against company like the EEOC. We would work with them, do the initial research and investigations for them. I found it very disheartening that this kind of stuff is allowed. But as you see, when you read in magazines and newspapers, it happens every single day. I think there's a question, Shauna, Stephanie, it looks like. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Yes, I, we can hear you. I wanted to see if I could just get some clarity or some guidance around being a sponsor versus being an ally to someone versus mentoring. Like to some of, it seems like there's a lot of overlap and maybe the terms are kind of like thrown around, but just um, some things I've experienced this week where it's like, okay, well, what are you? Like, what lane do you actually fall in? Um, and what's the best approach at times to, to be that person to recognize someone's, you know, gifts or talents and to give them that, that opportunity? At that point, am I your ally? Am I your sponsor? Do you, do I now, you become, I'm your, you're my mentee. Um, I'm trying to, you know, to resolve maybe some, like, what lane should I stay in? Because I don't want to overstep and then I don't want to do too much, but I don't want to leave you hanging. May I address that question? Please. Um, Ms. Stephanie, I, I have found that asking an individual how you want me to show up for you, let's talk about that. Are you wanting me to support you from afar? Are you needing guidance and mentoring? 
are you asking for um, professional coaching or assistance in that way? And, and sometimes I guess it may, depending on who the individual is, it might muddle up. But if they're, be, if they're able to go away and think about it, you know, say, you know, don't tell me, you don't have to tell me right now, but I want to be the best I can be for you. Oh, I hate when that happens. Where'd she go? Oh, and so oh, <laughs> you were at the top of the screen, now you're in the bottom of the corner. Um, uh, because I want to be what you need. If you're really trying to be there for that person, you know, you, you let them know you want to be um, what's going to be useful for them, what's going to be helpful. And um, you can't guess. So what's going to be the most effective, uh, efficient way to help you? So go away, take some time. What is it you want from this relationship or this partnership, this um, as you're building your network, what is it that you need specifically? And if you're able to fill that need, I think then you can address it. But if you're, you're not and you say, well, here's what I can do. I'm actually able to do these things for you. And um, um, but I do know, you know, and then maybe connect this, this individual with someone else uh, or bring in other people into the network and help them grow their, their circle of support so that they're getting what they need from a couple of different places. But you still have identified what it is specifically you're able to do and, and, it's, um, and how it's going to uh, fill a specific need for that person. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, I'm really trying to direct them elsewhere. Um, as a project manager, I like to manage my work. I don't like to manage Thank people. You. And I recognize that about myself also being ISTJ. I see you, but I'm not, I don't want to like necessarily take that on, but mm -hmm. then I'm listening and maybe that's something I should do. That would definitely be pushing myself outside of my comfort zone because I'll find you a resource. I don't necessarily want to be the one. To, yeah, I think that's what you say. Yeah. So. I am willing to connect you with resources. I can be a listening ear, but that's kind of where, you know, just, yeah. just to let them know. So they're not keep pushing on you. And you're like, then they walk away saying, well, dang, she don't ever want to help me. <laughs> you're like, that's not the case. It's just not where I'm comfortable right, right. now. Right. So yeah. no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess one thing that I would uh, like to add, and this may be a little bit different, Stephanie, than where you were. Uh, wanted the the response of the question to go, but you you dropped two words in there that really carry a lot of weight that I think sometimes individuals don't understand what uh, what their words truly mean, and that mm. would be mentor and sponsor. Uh, mentor I see as having it's a reciprocal relationship, uh, and I am very guarded of that word mentor. Uh, just because I may be older than someone or have more years of experience than someone does not mean that I am suited to be your mentor. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes people use that word using that type of, you know, example that I just shared as the basis of how that conversation should go. Uh, I think that mentoring, uh, my mentee should be also able to mentor to me as well. So I should be able to learn from them just as much as they can learn from me. Uh, it's a reciprocal relationship. Uh, the sponsor, you know, the sponsor is that person who's at the table, who got a seat at that table that I don't have the seat at, but can talk to my skill set. And if somebody says, you know what, we really need this individual with these type of characteristics. Does anybody know someone that has this? Oh, yeah. Hey, y'all. You know what? Lisa, yes, that Lisa, she can be able to do that and she can set it off. So you can be able, a sponsor can be your voice and be your advocate at those places and spaces that you are not able to be represented at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So we are coming up on time and uh, want to be respectful of that. And so I am going to ask my fellow ISTJ sister that's on here, uh, Miss Stephanie Redfern Briggs, to give us our the closing remarks. Thank you. Um, so primarily, I just want to thank everybody for their their words. It's been an absolute pleasure to to listen to everyone, um, and thank you, Dr. Patrick, for including me um, on this um, event. So I've also known her for 20 plus years and she's awesome, let's throw that out there. 
So, but each of us individually, as we go about our daily lives are always trying to improve ourselves, working and seeking to make a meaningful contribution personally, as well as professionally. But when we take a step toward working together to assist, to listen, um, to uplift those around us, we are better, we are stronger together. So we're not just as individuals, but you become a unit um, and strengthening the fabric of that unit in the team and organizations is how we can grow together, especially as women today um, and during unconventional times. So in trying to strengthen the fabric, we all must answer the call to action. In the past few years, obviously dealing with COVID, we've had to kind of push ourselves into different directions dare I say pivot, but it, it's, that is the buzzword, um, and require even our leadership to take note and to take action by offering you know, different solutions and different scenarios for us all to be able to, to work in. Um, and the uncertainty that accompanied a lot of those unconventional periods, it just, it couldn't be ignored. To survive is imperative to move, to thrive it's imperative to create that which does not exist or enhance that which does exist, creating a more aware and proactive environment where each individual feels valued, they feel heard and respected requires leaders to answer this call to action, thereby creating a culture where employee voices are amplified and new opportunities for development are presented and encouraged. You ladies today, this panel focused on three factors, organizational change, cultural awareness and continuous learning. And I'm gonna say that one more time for the people in the back. Organizational change, cultural awareness, and continuous learning. You all answered the call today. The knowledge and expertise that you all offered, um, the insight to various perspectives, awareness of beneficial tactics, methods in which to, effective, to be effective with movement, um, to shift where positive change can be realized. Even during these challenging times, um, with the proper lens, we can see hope in each of these factors, hope for innovative ideas, hope for being included at the table, hope for continuous growth. And today I would like to challenge you to become an ally for your team and your organization as a whole, you know, for all of us in the gallery who had an opportunity to listen to these wonderful women. Become the sponsor who recommends individuals for stretch assignments or shares talents suggested guidance from team members to openly acknowledge their abilities. You know, that's my call for right, right now, call to action is to become a sponsor. Um, become the champion who redirects questions to employees with a special talent or expertise in a certain area rather than responding as a leader of the team, um, sit back and give someone else the floor, especially if they did all the work. That's a whole nother personal story. Um, you want to give that dormant talent an opportunity to shine or someone who is more introverted. Um, not that you have to push them in front of the bus, but give them a little nudge. And, and, you know, stand beside them, let them know you're there to support them. Become the change you want to see in your space at all times. And um, again, I thank you all and thank you for allowing me to have closing thoughts. Dr. Patrick, back to you. Thank you, Mrs. Briggs. This has been wonderful. Some powerful words you've shared this evening, and I think they resonate with all of us. And at this time, I'm going to share my screen so um, everyone can see the contact info for our panel members. And... taking its time, but it's coming. There we go. Is it still there or did it go away? It went away. All right, all right. So I'm gonna move this. Okay, can you all see it now? Yes. I think it's still on the transition. That's why it was going away. But yeah, I just want to make sure the audience um, had an opportunity to get the contact info of the panelists. Feel free to reach out to them if you have additional questions. Um, and we thank you so much.
for joining us this evening. I thoroughly enjoy being here and it's always a pleasure and an honor to share this time and grow together. Um, Carl, any last words? No, you did an outstanding job again. I mean, I loved it and thank you. And thank all of the panelists and everyone that attended. So look out for next year, 2023. All right, you all take care, have a good night and be safe.